Hi everyone and welcome to today's video where we're going to be doing a guide for Manchu for EU4 1.35 Domination. So John Zhu starts off as the prime candidate to form Manchu. We start off in the region of Manchuria and as a tributary of Ming and John Zhu has received quite a few changes in this latest update mainly to the mission tree right here and various modifiers that we get and of course the changes that Ming has received directly influence our gameplay as well because like I said we start off as their tributary and we will be fighting them pretty soon so that is definitely important to us as well. And of of course the nation of Qing that we're going to be forming later on has received quite a few updates as well which makes playing in this region even more fun. By playing as Zhu, you will be forming Manchu and Qing in no time dominating your horde neighbors pushing into Korea pushing into these other hordes right here and expanding into Ming and I think that has never been easier because Ming is the weakest it has ever been in this latest update. These amazing national ideas right here plus 10% morale of armies and plus 15% national manpower as a starter then we got attrition for enemies government thingy land leader shock man Power recovery speed, chance of a new air, improved relations, possible Manchu banners plus 15%, and minus 10% land attrition, and this amazing mission tree make playing Zhu even that more fun. So sit back and relax and learn how to play as Zhu, then Manchu, and then Qing. All right, right here we are as John Zhu, and of course the first thing we're gonna do right here is introduce the Vision Quest and adopt Yellow Shamanism. Then we need to kickstart our mission tree by doing these two missions right here, which require us to basically conquer land around us, and we won't be strictly focusing on these missions because they'll come along naturally as we expand. Next, we need to go into our estates, and we have only one estate, of course, the tribes, and we're gonna be giving them some privileges, but first, you can go ahead and summon the diet and choose the only agenda that's available to you. Next, we're gonna give the tribes larger tribal hosts and then we're gonna sell titles and seize land now we need to go ahead and prepare for our first war and our first war is gonna be most likely versus Hai Shi or Orochoni right here these are the first two nations that we want to fight especially Hai Shi because we do need the province of Jilin right here to form Manchu so simply take your army right here as we can see we have eight infantry regiments and three cavalry regiments and our force limit is 15 so what you're gonna do is simply recruit four banner regiments right here and we're gonna attach these to our main army and there we go we just need to wait for these guys to build up and then we'll start our first war we're not making that much money right at the start as john Zhu, especially if you max out root out corruption after getting these regiments right here but don't worry even though we're going to be struggling with cash in the early game once you take care of all of these guys right here money won't be a problem anymore and later when you fight ming you'll be rolling in ducats so don't worry about going into debt and losing money right now Additionally, we're also going to hire one advisor right at the start, a military advisor, and get a morale, discipline, fort defense, or manpower level 1 advisor. I do have this fort defense guy, so I am going to hire him. Next, with our free diplomats, with one of them, you can start spying on Hai Shi. The spy network will help us siege them down a little bit faster. With the other one, you can go ahead and start spying on Orochoni. Like I said, these are the first two nations that we want to fight. And with the third available diplomat, you can go ahead and Royal Mary Ming to get some better relations with them. We do want to have good relations with them until we fight them and then once this guy comes back i'm simply going to improve relations with oirat simply because that's what my agenda is telling me to do otherwise i'd keep this guy free and use him to declare war and send peace deals and such nations may send you alliance offers you don't need alliances once a couple of months have passed and the nations around you have allied each other you can go ahead and set some rivals and i recommend rivaling the only nations that are available to you which will be haishi orochoni in korea once your banners have filled up it is time to start your first war and before that we're gonna put this general right here that we start with in charge of the army and we're gonna go ahead and declare on Hai Shi. In my case Hai Shi is actually allied to Orochoni another nation that we want to fight so that's excellent. If you can take out both of these guys in one single war that's great if not you're just gonna declare separate wars and let's see Orochoni they actually do have one more ally the nation of Shibe right here so I'm just gonna go ahead and white piece these guys because I am gonna co-belligerent Orochoni and there we go there's the co-belligerent like I said only white piece on these guys and in this first war I'm planning on annexing both Haishi and Orochoni. You're gonna full annex whoever you're fighting out of these two guys right here. So there we go, I'm just gonna declare a tribal feud for Jilin, and there we go, the war has started. If you're fighting three nations like me in your first war, you may want to get the free company up and running to help you out a little bit, even though it will take you over force limit. If you're fighting just one or two nations in this war, you don't need the free company. Additionally, you can tell the free merchant to collect in Beijing from now, even though that won't really do anything. And that's it. After a very short time, this war for me is done. I white piece Shibe, like I said, and after that deleted my free company just so I don't lose that much money. And now I can go ahead and piece these guys out. So I'm going to go ahead and separate piece Orochoni and full annex them and take all of their money. And now that the diplomat is back, I'll also piece out Haishi, full annex them and take all of their money. And that's your first or first and second wars done. 
you should have full annex Haishi and Orochoni. After this happens, you will be able to take the mission Unite the Fragments, where we gain a perma claim on the Manchuria region, and two advanced cavalry regiments will appear in our capital. And there we go, we have the Step Riders Cavalry Regiment, which are available all the way at Miltech 10. Super, super powerful. Once these wars are done, as always, go ahead and raise the provinces, because we are a horde, we do want to get those points, and we do want to make them cheaper to core, and cheaper to dev later on as well, because we will be spawning institutions, and after that, you can go ahead and core them up. Once your first or first and second wars are done, you'll notice that we only need to state up Jilin right here, which is a province we took from Haishi, and we only need to conquer one more province, because after you beat up Haishi and Orochoni, you will be at 19 provinces. So, once you wrap up the war with these two guys, simply fight whoever out of your neighbors, Korchin, Shibe, Nanai, or Nivik, are the easiest to fight. There really is no strict requirement for which nation you should go for. Let's see Korshin right here, they're kind of big and they're allied to Nanai, Shibe I have a truce with, Nanai are allied to Oirat and Korshin, so let's take a look at Nivik, they're only allied to Solon, so that's who I'm gonna go for. Fight the easiest nation out of any of your neighbors. So I'm gonna take my army up here and then declare on them. And there's my war versus Nivik, of course I am gonna declare with the tribal conquest CB. I could co-belligerent Solon right here, it doesn't really matter, if I don't co-belligerent them I can just white piece them, and after we form Manchu will gain cores on the entire region of Manchuria, so you won't be able to raise these other provinces that you'll take after you form Manchu, but then again, you also won't have to core them. So it's totally up to you how much or how little you take in this third war for the one additional province. Of course, I could have done this in my first war as well by taking one more province from Shibe right here, but I just didn't do it. Either way, here's my next war. And there we go. I've defeated Solon and Nivik, and I will be full annexing both of them and taking all of their money. And that's my next war done. Now it's time for me to beat up these rebels, raise these provinces, full state Jilin right here, and then I can form Manchu. Very easy. Now as you can see right here, I only needed two more provinces in fact to form Manchu, not one like I said earlier, and because all of these provinces right here in the Manchuria region are gonna become our cores, what I'm gonna do is simply core just two of them, just the two cheapest ones. In fact, they're all 11 except this one which is 30, so I'm just gonna core up these two, and later after I form Manchu, all of these are going to become our cores, so I'll save about 100 admin points right here. So that's what I'm going to wait for. After we form Manchu, then we're going to move on with our next wars and wipe out the remaining Jurchen tribes up here, which in my case are Nana and Shibe, and the tribe of Korchen as well. Around this point is also when you want to start spying on Ming. This isn't to get claims on them or anything, but we want to keep that spy network maxed out as much as possible because later it's going to help us a lot when sieging Beijing. After you get the tech 4 in every category, Category, don't start spawning the Renaissance just yet. Our capital right here, when we start off as Zhangzhou, is in this province, which is a mountain province. But after we form Manchu, it's gonna move to these grasslands over here in Jilin, which is gonna make it cheaper to dev, of course. So don't spawn the Renaissance just yet. Wait for that after you form Manchu and after you get Tech 4 in every category. Apologies for the wrong information earlier, but I forgot that you actually need 20 provinces that are Jurchen or Manchu culture, which are only these southern tribes right here. So for your third war, maybe. Maybe don't fight Solan or Nivik up here, instead fight Shibe or Nanai so you can get the Jurchen cultured provinces. So apologies for that, what I'm gonna do now is actually declare on Korshin right here so I can take provinces from Nanai without fighting Oirat because Nanai are allied to Oirat and so are Shibe. So that's what I'm gonna declare on Korshin with the Tribal Feud CB. By the way, I'm still not coring these provinces up because we're gonna get free cores on them anyway. And now that this war is done, I'm gonna go ahead and separate piece Nanai right here and take all of their money and full annex them. Of course, as always, we're gonna be raising these provinces or at least the provinces that we can. And what I'm gonna do is simply core up two of these cheapest ones right here that are Jurchen culture. And after that, we'll form Manchu and all of these will become our cores. At least the ones that are in the Manchuria region, not the ones you'll take from Korshin. But since I'm fighting Korshin and we're gonna be doing that anyway, I'll also go ahead and full annex them. You shouldn't really care about aggressive expansion in the early game when fighting any of the tribes bordering you. And that's my war with Korshin done. By this point, you may have wiped out all of the nations up here, it doesn't really matter how quick you are. And now that I cored up the two specific provinces that I took from this nation right here, I can go ahead and adopt Manchu identity. You will be doing the same once you have 20 Jurchen cultured provinces. So like I reminded you earlier, after you fight Haishi and Orochoni, fight one of the other Jurchen guys and not Nivik or Solon up here like I did. But there we go, once you can, you're immediately gonna go ahead and form Nanchu. You are gonna get new traditions and ambitions. Ming gets the event, the rise of Manchuria, and of course, we 
we gain cores on all of the provinces that are in the region of Manchuria, and we become the Manchu culture, which is part of the Chinese culture group. After this, you can go ahead and full state all of this. Of course, Manchu ideas are different to Zhangzhou ideas. We start off at minus 5% land maintenance and plus 1 land leader shock, plus 15% morale of armies as a finisher, and then as our first idea, we have a double 1 plus 15% national manpower and minus 15% core creation cost, plus 25% possible Manchu banners, which are the unique regiments that we have. Another double idea right here, a stab discount and institution spread, yearly horde unity, cavalry combat plus 15%, miltech discount, and AE impact minus 10%. After you do for Manchu, your capital will flip to Jilin, of course, and you will activate the encouraged development state edict in this state right here, the state of South Jilin, and you will go ahead and develop your capital and spawn the Renaissance. And there we go. After I developed the 36, I did the 10, 13, 13. Now I have the Renaissance and once I have enough money and once it spreads enough, I will be able to embrace it. By the point you form Manchu, you may have already taken care of all the nations up here in the region of Manchuria, your starting neighbors, in which case you need to think about your options. You can either start pushing into some of the other neighbors, which aren't the starting tribes like Korea or Oirat and Mongolia right here, or you can get ready to fight Ming. Because Ming will get the Rise of Manchuria event, their mandate will tank and a lot of the nations around them will stop being their tributaries. And let's take a look at Ming in my game right here in 1458. 70k troops, 22k manpower so they're pretty strong in that regard and they're the same tech as me but look at their mandate right now it's zero and they've lost so many tributaries so with us automatically stopping being their tributary these guys have left as well an additional option you have right here is not forming manchu staying as their tributary and growing even more powerful maybe fighting orat and mongolia in korea growing like this big all around them and then you form manchu and then you stop being their tributary it's totally up to you but i don't think that's necessary because Ming is so weak so you can form Manchu immediately and a bunch of these other guys will stop being their tributary as well so either way once you do form Manchu and once you stop being their tributary your choices are to get ready to fight Ming or to get ready to fight some of the other nations around you in order to grow more powerful yourself for your tier 2 government reform you should of course select martial society for plus 20 percent national manpower after you form Manchu and full state everything, make sure to lower autonomy everywhere as well. This will boost our income significantly and it'll give us a bigger force limit as well, something that we do need in order to fight Ming. And when you have the ability to raise more banners, go ahead and do it. Try and get up to eight as fast as you can, we do need eight banners for a mission right here. After building up my army a little bit, and right now in 1459, it's 1515. Eight cavalry regiments are, of course, the banners, and two are the advanced tech ones from tech 10. But after you do that, and after you get 90% force limit, and fulfill some other requirements right here, you will be able to take the mission, the eight banners, where we gain army drill gain modifier plus 33% until the end of the game for banner regiments. And also, they won't give us that much corruption. And once you do have 12,000 cav and lower autonomy, you will be able to take the mission, reorganize the tribes, which gives us raising power gain plus 10%, manpower recovery speed plus 10%, and 0.5 yearly core unity, along with a 10 reduction in autonomy in all Manchu culture provinces. And you will also be able to take the mission, dominate the rival Jurchens, where this event happens. Basically, you have three options with this Nurhatsi ruler right here. You can either select him to be your ruler and he'll receive the legendary conqueror ruler trait. More on that later. Or you can make him a general, a really, really powerful general. 3653. This is going to be super valuable versus Ming, by the way. Or the third option right here is to simply make him an advisor, which of course you shouldn't go with. And out of these two options, I do recommend the first option right here because he is going to be an amazing ruler i know this really strong general right here a six shock three siege general is going to be really helpful but i still do recommend choosing the first option right here he will serve as the head of an emerging great power and there we go he becomes ruler a six 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 ruler and he has the legendary conqueror trait which is minus five years of separatism and plus 10 percent shock damage which is really really powerful better than a general even though he's really good as a general too now, as I said previously, once you wrap up the Jurchen tribes right here, and the only reason I haven't fought Shibe is because they're allied to Orat, you need to decide whether to push into Orat and Mongolia, and Korea, or into Ming. Depending on what's better in your situation, do that. There's no real strict requirement if you have to fight these guys first or Ming first. But if you have a nice opportunity to fight Ming right after you fight all of these guys, then you should definitely go for it. And here's what you need to look out for. You need Ming to be at low mandate, which they are in my case right here, and you need to be a Miltek over Ming, which 
which I am in my case. I'm at Miltech 5, they're at Miltech 4, and additionally, they're also fighting some nation down here, Lan Shang, so their armies will be focused down here and it'll be easy for us to fight them. Don't be scared of Ming, even if they have a way bigger army than you, even if they still have a bunch of manpower, if their mandate is low, and if you have a Miltech over them, you can very easily defeat them. So, that's exactly what I'm gonna do in my case, declare on Ming right here, and you have two options for your CB, you can either go with the Tribal Conquest, where you can beat them up a lot, which you'll be able to do very easily and gain war score from that, or you can use the Take Mandate of Heaven CB, where we gain 50% less aggressive expansion, and the provinces are 50% cheaper, so you can take a lot more. It's solely up to you, the Take Mandate of Heaven CB is obviously better, and we're of course not gonna be taking the Mandate of Heaven, we're just gonna be taking provinces. So, whenever you're ready, go ahead and declare on Ming for the Mandate of Heaven. And by the way, a good reason for not fighting Ming right away and fighting Oirat and Mongolia and Korea first is that you will be able to do the mission, issue the seven grievances right here, which basically requires us to have 300 dev, everything else will be already fulfilled, and you will gain some powerful modifiers right here when fighting Ming. Of course, you don't have to use this mission for your first war, you can use it later on too. And there we go, my war with Ming is pretty much done, I've just been sieging them down, in fact, I only fought one battle right here, and they're already on low, their war exhaustion is super high, they don't have any troops, rebel have started popping up and they're even coalitioned by someone because they fought someone down here this war is done and of course in your first war versus ming what you're gonna do is first take all of their money we do have provinces up here which are already our cores as you can see we're not getting a lot of aggressive expansion from that and after that you can just take as much as you want from them what i'm gonna do in my game is take some of these provinces right here being careful not to go over 100 over extension and i'm gonna do something like this why not and that's your first war versus ming done You've gotten your cores back, you've gotten all of their money that you could, and you've gotten some additional provinces. After you do this, you will be able to take a couple of missions, mainly issue the seven grievances right here, where this event happens. And basically, we gain the declaration of the seven grievances until the death of our current ruler, and you do want to do this after you get this awesome ruler right here, where you gain plus 20% siege ability and plus one global attacker dice roll bonus. There we go, a super super powerful mission. After that, you will also be able to bypass the Great Wall, where you gain man power in the Laoning area, which is right here, and stability, or if you're at war with the Emperor while you take this mission, you gain some manpower and lose war exhaustion. And since we're already so powerful, I do recommend taking this mission at peacetime to gain some dev and stability. Of course, after you take Ming's money, you will also be able to embrace the Renaissance, and you will be able to tech up. And speaking of teching up, once you hit Admin Tech 5, you will be able to select your first idea group, and since this is going to be a blobbing campaign, regardless if we stay as Manchu, regardless if we stay as Qing, we do want to open up with a blobbing set of ideas, and we're going to be taking blobbing-focused idea groups as well. And for that, I do recommend opening up with diplomatic ideas, and after that, with Admin. Of course, if you don't think Diplo is good enough for the diplomats, which will help us avoid coalitions for the diplo advisor cost maybe we'll get some subjects to province war score cost minus 20 percent is very important since we'll be able to take a lot more so it's generally a good idea to take this idea group when you expand a lot but if you don't feel like it's good enough you could open up with a mill idea group and i do recommend offensive or quality for that those are going to help us out the most you could go with horde ideas but later when you form ching you won't be a horde anymore so they won't be that useful or if you're not planning on forming ching you could of course definitely take horde ideas but either way what i recommend is diplo however if you don't feel like they're good enough go with quality or offensive either way for our second idea group we'll be taking admin later on i'm gonna open up with diplo of course at this point we're still a horde so don't forget to raise everything that you take from ming you will gain lots of nice points lots of money and stuff like that from these super highly developed provinces in china once you state up some of the provinces that you took from Korchin, I do recommend promoting the Korchin culture, which will enable us to take the mission for the Horde right here. And what you get is different based on what you do for this mission. So if you ally an Altaic culture group nation, which are these uh, blue culture guys right here, you'll gain 0.5 yearly Horde unity and a diplomat that's 50% cheaper. If you subjugate one of those guys, you gain yearly army tradition and special force limit. And if you do that by accepting culture, you gain a dev discount and monthly autonomy change, which I do think is the best. So after you promote caution take this mission. When you pay off all your loans and when you start making money, like I am barely doing right now, you'll also be able to take the mission a Manchu script, which gives us some institution bonuses and cost of advisors with ruler culture discount until we form Qing. We've pretty much completed this entire branch of the mission tree right here. This part over here focuses on us expanding into Korea, and this mission down here focuses on us expanding into Orat, which of course we will be doing, doesn't matter if it's after you fought Ming or before you fight Ming. Either way, after you fought Ming, you're gonna focus on Orat or Korea, 
after you fought Korea, you're going to focus on Orat or Ming. And after you fight Orat, you're going to focus on Ming and Korea. Basically, the three largest nations that we border right now. Sometime after forming Qing, you will want to give the tribes autonomy of the tribes as well. Once you wrap up a war versus one of your three neighbors right here, you will continue to fight the wars versus those same guys. And I do recommend fighting Orat and their subject Mongolia if they still exist. This is going to be a very annoying war since they're so big and you'll have to carpet siege them, fight them, chase them around. But of course it is necessary that we fight Orat since we do need the province of Shilingol right here to form Qing and our mission tree does tell us to expand into them as well. So whenever you're ready, after your first war versus one of these three guys, fight your next war versus them. Doesn't matter who it is. In this war, I'm also going to annex Shibe, and I'm just going to declare it with the Tribal Feud CB for Shilling Gol. Of course, if some of these guys are still Ming tributaries, that's even better. You can go ahead and take Ming's money again and reset your truce with them for it to be shorter. So don't worry if some of the guys you want to fight are still Ming tributaries. That's in fact a good thing. It'll be super easy for you to peace out Ming, take all of their money and reset your truce with them. For your tier 3 government reform, you should go with religious society. Right now, I'm going to go ahead and full annex Shibe. I'm still in this war with Oirat, very annoying. Luckily, by taking this super powerful mission right here, siege phases are super super short and and we take down forwards very fast. And there we go. Now that I have defeated Orat, I'll take as much as possible. You'll be doing the same with them, with Ming, with Korea, with whatever Chinese minor nation you fight that pops out over here. Coalitions aren't a problem while we're fighting these three guys in the initial starting Jurchen tribes up here. So what I'm going to do is take as much as I can along in this border region right here. Of course, if you're super, super aggressive, you can just snake all the way through them in order to reach Europe faster and try to fight some of these European-ish hordes, as I like to call them. But if you're going for normal gameplay, just take whatever you can over here that's close to you. Of course, focusing on shill and goal as well. What I'm going to do is this. Yes, it is a weird peace deal, but I do want to take the fort provinces that they took from Ming when they fought them just now. So this is my war with Oirat done. Take as much as you can. And at a certain point, you will be able to take the mission, proclaim the later Jin, which is super, super powerful. Our country name changes to the later Jin or latter Jin, whatever you want to call it. We gain 25 prestige and everything else is converted into monarch power, which will happen in my case, and the super powerful event Nurhachi's reforms will happen, and this is what happens. Basically, we gain minus 0.1 yearly corruption and plus 20% reform progress growth for about 25 years. For your first stage ability, you should select Justified Wars. Around this point is when you'll also want to give the tribes tribes land rights. Of course, due to all the raising, you will be taking up super, super fast. As we can see right here, we're pretty much the most advanced nation we can see. And when you take Admin Tech 7 for your second idea group, no matter if you open up with Diplo or Offensive or Quality for your second idea group, you will want to go with Admin Ideas. These are super, super strong. The minus 25% core creation cost along with the core creation cost we already have and that we will have when we form Ching is super, super powerful. We, just like Diplo gains a Diplo Advisor discount, we gain an Admin Advisor discount. The Promote Culture cost is great for us as a horde the admin tech discount and the monthly autonomy change are great and of course we do need the plus 20 percent governing capacity as well so like i said this is a blobbing campaign we're taking blobbing idea groups diplo and then admin after you wrap up a war with two out of the three guys it's time to move on with the third guy that we want to fight out of korea ming or Oret. and in my case it's korea and keep in mind that korea is actually deceptively strong they will be up to date in tech they have pretty strong units and they have really defensible provinces along with two capitals which is kind of weird but Either way, out of all of the nations that we fought so far, including Ming, Korea is probably the most difficult nation you'll fight. Either way, they're not a problem. We are super, super strong. So go ahead and declare on Korea as well. And when you go ahead and beat up Korea and siege down their level 4 fort, if they even have it, you will want to take as much as possible, primarily focusing on these two areas up in the north right here for a mission, and then you can do something like this, for example. Korea is a pretty wealthy nation, they are deceptively large, so we will need around two to maybe even three wars, depending on the deving they've been doing, to take them down. But this is enough for your first war versus them. After you beat up Korea a little bit, you will be able to take this mission right here, which gives us plus 50% cavalry to infantry ratio for 10 years, along with travels loyalty. And each time we take one of these Korean focus missions right here, that modifier will refresh. Once you do that mission, you'll be able to do this one as well, where we lose some corruption, gain Yuli Hor unity, and if we have a temple in Janju, it gets replaced 
priest with a great temple, if not, we just gain a temple. Then, if you've taken yellow or black shamanism, which is a decision and you should have taken yellow shamanism, you will also be able to take this mission right here, where you gain this top bonus right here, plus one tolerance of heathens and plus one maximum tolerance of heathens as well. When you end up taking provinces from Korea, I do recommend full stating this and accepting the Korean culture. There we go, 1483 and I've already wrapped up Diplo ideas. Once your truce with whoever you fought first out of these three nations expires, it's time to hit them again. In my case it's Ming and of course you will keep pushing into Ming. If Ming don't exist anymore or if you don't border them, you're just gonna push into these other Chinese nations that have popped out from them. But either way, at this point when fighting Ming, we're aiming to wipe them out so we stop the mandate of heaven from existing because to form Qing, we either need to have the mandate not exist or we need to be the emperor of China. It's totally up to you whether you want to play with the mandate or without. If you want to play with the mandate, make sure to take it from Ming in your final war. If not, you're just gonna wipe out whoever the holder of the mandate of heaven is, which is most likely gonna be Ming or Shun or however pops out. Either way, once your truce with whoever you fought is up, make sure to declare on them again. If you're fighting Ming, use the mandate of having CB. And you have no idea how fast these sieges are with, with that siege ability that we have from that event and with additional bonuses you may gain. In fact, I also have a three siege general, which makes these forts fall super, super quickly. And once you beat up Ming in your second war, once again, you're going to take as much as you can from them. You could take money from them again, although at this point it isn't that relevant when you can't take that much and where they're not that powerful. So just take whatever you want from Ming. I'm going to take some provinces right here that I have claims on from estate agendas, and then I'm going to take a bunch of their coastline because those are super valuable provinces but be careful not to go over 100 over extension so let's see maybe we can do something like uh well looks like this is about enough for this war of course if you can handle more than 100 over extension then definitely go for it and that's my second war with ming done these are high value provinces so don't worry if you can't take a lot of course, overextension will go down once you raise the provinces, so keep that in mind as well. Now that my truce with Oirat is up, I'll be declaring on them again, and once again we're rotating our truces between the three initial nations that I mentioned, Korea, Ming, and Oirat, and if you don't border Ming, some of the smaller Chinese nations. I'm gonna declare on Oirat right here, using the Tribal Feud CB. For a tier 4 government reform, we have some really good options, including two unique ones right here, the first of which being 8 banners, and banners gain 33% reinforced speed, which makes them recruit a little faster, along with minus 10% attrition, and then our entire army gets minus 0.5 yearly army tradition decay, plus 10% movement speed, and plus 25% possible Manchu banners, which is really strong. Then we have the green standard army, which is very, very cool. Winning battles gives us 10% of the manpower of the enemy troops which have died in that battle, and plus 20% manpower recovery speed both of these are super strong but then of course as a horde we could also go with cavalry warfare right here although i do most recommend one of these two simply because they are unique and later of course when we form ching we will lose these things either way so definitely go with one of these two they're both really really strong i'm gonna go with the eight banners in my game right here and there we go now that my war with oirat is done i'll be taking as much as i can over in this region because our mission requires us to conquer some provinces over here so what i'm gonna do is simply take the provinces that the mission tells me to take along with something else down here. And this is about as much as I can take right now. That's my second war with Oirat done. Once you do that yourself, you will be able to take the mission and the Yuan, which gives us 50 power projection, 20 prestige, and everything else gets converted into monarch points. And with that, we're almost done with our mission tree. We just need to beat up Korea one more time. As you can see, even with such aggressive expansion, coalitions aren't a problem. In my game, Min has just become the Emperor of China, which is uh, this nation right here. So obviously, the next time I fight Ming, I won't be able to use the Mandate of Heaven CB. So I'll just be using the regular one. But then again, if I do fight Min, I will be able to wipe out the Emperor of China. Now that my truce with Korea is up, I'll be declaring on them once again. Right now, I've also just wrapped up admin ideas, and with Diplo and admin, you get this policy for an additional diplomat and minus 0.05 monthly autonomy change. And just like that, I've defeated Korea, but I can't full annex them. One province remains. Like I said, you'll need two or three wars to take these guys down, since they do so much deving. The Korean Peninsula has a lot more development than you think. Either way. It's just gonna be this one province left. But after you take care of a big portion of the Korean Peninsula, you will be able to take the mission the Hermit Kingdom, where the event, the conquest of Korea happens, and we can choose to adopt an aspect of their culture into our country. Basically, we can study their alphabet for a tech discount for 25 years. We can gain goods produced for 25 years, national manpower idea discount, 
or a culture conversion cost discount. It's totally up to you which one you use. Obviously, the goods produced and the idea cost is the best. But then again, we're not taking ideas right now. We were way ahead of tech, so we don't need the discount. So I'm just going to go for the goods produced in my game right here. Choose whichever one you want. They're all great. And after we get done with the Hermit Kingdom, we're pretty much left with only one Manchu mission to complete. Factional stability right here, which requires us to have level 3 advisors in every category, along with 40% crownland to stab, and we need to be making money. So maybe getting level 3 advisors and still making money is going to be a little bit difficult, but you can try and complete it. It is pretty strong. It gives us 150 government reform progress, along with monthly admin points plus one for 20 years, which is super, super strong. That's 20 times 12 admin points, however much that is. I think it's about 240, and the estate's loyalty is pretty great too. Pretty bad event right here, the Yangtze River Flood. Luckily, it did get fixed in the latest patch. Once you hit admin tech eight, make sure to build as many courthouses as you can. We will be struggling with GovCap. Now that my truce with Ming is up, I'll be declaring on them once again. You should be doing the same. We're still pushing into the same three nations right here. If Ming is still the emperor, we're focusing on them a lot. But what I'm doing right here is fighting Ming simply so I can fight Min, so I can show you how you wipe out the Mandate of Heaven, and then you form Qing. Either way, I don't have the Take Mandate of Heaven CB, so I'm just going to declare it with Tribal Conquest. I can take a lot less using this CB. Remember, the Mandate of Heaven is the one we want to use versus a Chinese nation. And once again, I've defeated Ming, I'll take these coastal provinces right here to gain a border with Min, and then I'll just take some stuff up here that are more inland. I am over 100 overextension, but raising will bring it down. Now, since I'm almost overflowing with points and colonialism has already spawned, of course, I am going to be deving for colonialism. Let's see what's a pretty cheap province to dev right here. How much does Beijing cost? It is a nice province to dev, but it's already pretty highly dev. So, of course, you will want to look for some farmland, some centers of trade. And Jinan here should be pretty cheap to develop. So that's exactly what I am going to develop this province right here. And there we go. Easy. Now to move on with my wars, I am going to declare on Min right here, who is currently the Emperor of China, just to show you what happens once you wipe out the Mandate of Heaven and once you have the ability to form Qing. However, what I recommend is that you stay a horde until you get to conquer all of China and only then form Qing. It is going to be super easy to conquer these provinces, super cheap to dev, and you can raise them and stuff like that. But if you want to play Qing and you're excited, you can go ahead and form them as soon as you wipe out the Emperor. Usually it's going to be Ming, like I said, so you will have to make them not exist. But in my case, it's Min. So now I'll show you what happens when you do that. And there we go. Now that I have defeated Min, I'll take their capital province right here and I'll make them release Ning, which in turn will make them the holder of the Mandate of Heaven not exist. And there we go. That war is done. That's the end of the Min Empire or whichever empire held the Mandate. And now the Mandate of Heaven no longer exists. With that, we don't need to hold the Mandate anymore to form Qing. Instead, we need to become an empire, which by this point will be very possible since we're only about 40 dev away. For your tier 5 government reform, you should centralize power for even more core creation cost discount. Now that my truce with Orad is up, I'll go ahead and declare on them for the tribal feud for whatever province right here. Maybe this one, just so I can gain 40 dev to show you what happens when you form Qing. Now that I defeated Oirat as much as possible, I'll be taking as much as possible. And that's pretty much it. Now that we have more than a thousand dev, we can officially take the decision to become an empire. And with that, after we become an empire, we become an empire of Chinese culture. And of course, we can form the nation of Qing. And when you do take the decision to form Qing, there we go. Beijing will become our capital. And of course, you should select new traditions and ambitions. Qing ideas are some of the most powerful in the game, starting off with minus 25% core creation cost and minus 10% aggressive expansion impact. Since we've already taken admin ideas right now, we have a minus 50% core creation cost then we have plus 30 percent possible manchu banners which is super strong plus 15 percent national manpower and plus 15 percent manpower recovery speed minus two national unrest plus one government thingy plus five percent admin efficiency which is extremely strong minus 15 percent state maintenance monthly autonomy change plus 15 percent morale and prestige from land battles and a 15 percent advisor discount as a finisher of course when you do form ching you should go ahead and become a chinese kingdom tier one government reform now this does downgrade us to a kingdom app after we just became an empire but that's not really a problem we gain some awesome bonuses like plus 500 gov cap and plus 25 percent manpower recovery speed and even though we will go down to a kingdom the most important thing is we gain the unified china cb and as we can see that cb is super super powerful we only get 25 percent aggressive expansion for conquering the provinces in the chinese subcontinent along with a 50 percent discount on them and 150 prestige so it's super super strong and when you go into the missions don't be surprised that there are no missions down here so as 
past Ching, we have access to three different, you know, branches of the mission tree. The first one right here is the ones you inherit from John Zhu and from Manchu. Then, if you become the Emperor of China, basically, if you do take the Mandate of Heaven, you will gain the Celestial Emperor missions right here in the middle. So you have to scroll all the way past those missions if you didn't become the Emperor, just like me, in order to gain access to the Qing mission tree, which is all the way down here at the bottom, which focuses on playing tall, conquering, and developing your nation and stuff like that. A super, super strong branch of the mission tree, by the way. Of course, as Qing, you will gain access to estates as well, so you should immediately go ahead and summon the diet and choose whichever agenda is best for you, and then you should give the burgers land of commerce, patronage of the arts, commercial advisory board, and indebt it to the burgers for some money. Then you should give the clergy religious state, clerical advisory council, and clerical education, along with religious culture. And then you should give the nobles primacy of the nobility, increased levies, and aristocratic counselors. And then you can sell titles and seize land. Of course, you will be moving on with your government reforms as well. You can go strengthen noble privileges if you want to. If not, you should go ahead and compromise with the nobility. For your tier 3 government reform, you should go expand a real court. For tier 4, you should go with strengthen Confucian bureaucracy or maintain balance of power, whichever one you want to. Both of them are great. And for tier 5, you once again have the option to take one of the unique ones we took as Manchu early on, 8 banners or green standard army. It's totally up to you which one you take. Both of them are really good. And by the time colonialism comes around, your game should look a little something like this. Basically, we started off as John Zhu in these couple of provinces right here with the classic opening of fighting Haishi and Orochoni and all of our neighbors until we consolidated the region of Manchuria, slowly working through this top part of the mission tree right here, which are the John Zhu slash Manchu missions. After you've consolidated most of this region right here, you did have a couple of options, like I said earlier, and that was either to fight Ming if you felt like you were strong enough, if you had a Miltek advantage over them, and if they had low mandate, or if not, you could have gone on to fight Oirat and their subject Mongolia or Korea, and you could have formed Manchu in order to stop being a tributary of Ming, and with that, other nations stopped being their tributaries as well, or you could have stayed as Zhangju and stayed as their tributary and continued to fight some of their other tributaries. The choice was up to you, whether you fought Ming immediately and formed Manchu immediately, or expanded elsewhere and then hit Ming, depending on your opportunities. But once we got started with the initial wars versus Oirat, Ming, or Korea, those are the three nations you should have rotated your conquest between. Fight Ming, fight Oirat, fight Korea, it doesn't matter in which order, but those are the nations you mainly focused on, and by this point in the game, Oirat and Korea should have been mostly wiped out, and you should own a very sizable portion of China. Of course, while you're Manchu or later Jin, depending on if you took this mission or not, you should have continued to push into China, and the choice is totally up to you, like I said, whether you take the mandate and become the emperor of China with the mandate, or if you destroy Ming or whoever the holder of the mandate is, and then become an empire and then form Qing that way. It's totally up to you whether you want to play with the mandate or not. For this guide, I simply chose how to do it without taking the mandate. But if you do want to take the mandate, simply choose that in the peace deal when fighting the nation which holds the mandate. And by this point, we are one of the most powerful nations in the world. In fact, the most powerful nation in the world in my game right here with more than a thousand dev. You should be at a thousand dev around this point as well, depending on how aggressive or not aggressive you were. Of course, you can be a lot more aggressive than this. You could pretty much own all of this by this point if you're an experienced player or you may own a little bit less depending on your skill level. Now, of course, playing as this nation, it is a bit different to other nations since we are a horde and we're not focusing on developing our nation that much, building buildings that much. Mainly, we're focusing on expanding as rapidly as we can. And of course, with this insane ruler that I still have right here, who's actually 72 in my game right here, a 666 guy that we got from the event, generating modern points won't be a problem. I'm a tech nine in every category, the most advanced nation in the world, filled out diplo and admin ideas, which are, of course, blobbing ideas, like I said earlier, and you will have no shortage of points by raising and by having this amazing, amazing ruler. But either way, when you did have an excess of cash, you should have been building a couple of buildings. As we can see, I have 3,000 ducats right now, making 11 ducats, which is actually not a lot at all for a nation of this size. If it was slow and steady conquest with developing, we could have been making hundreds of ducats by now. But either way, I can go ahead and pay off some of my loans right here, and I'm making about 13 ducats, which is still very, very little. But speaking of buildings, I have built a couple of marketplaces. You've probably built a couple as well. Like I said, we're not really strictly focusing on that, a couple of production buildings here and there, a couple of churches, and a couple of government buildings to reduce governing capacity, but aside from that, we haven't been focusing on that too much, and only really developing when we max out points. I have been developing quite a bit, actually, especially in the Diplo and Mill Point categories, but either way, it's very, very weak compared to the conquests we've been doing. So after this point, once you form Qing, your game will stabilize a bit, you won't have to expand at that rapidly because you're not a horde anymore, and you could focus on upgrading centers of trade, moving around your 
your main trade node, moving around your merchants, building buildings, developing your nation. There's even a gold mine over in China and in Chagatai too here and over here in Tibet as well. You will be conquering those, so you'll be making money from them as well. So after you stop being a horde, your gameplay will slow down a bit and you can definitely focus more on the economic aspect of the game rather than on the conquest aspect. After this point, you will continue to expand in the same directions we've already been expanding. And of course, if you're still a horde, you will continue to push into the Chinese nations with the horde CBs or with the take the mandate of having CBs. If you're Qing, you will go ahead and fight them with the unified China CB and you'll continue to push in these directions. You'll go ahead and finish off Korea and then you need to focus on North China, South China, Xinan, Mongolia, Tibet right here. And sort of this is the region right here that you want to focus on in the early and the mid part of the game. Later on, you could push into Japan when you build up a sizable navy. You can push down into Southeast Asia, even into India. And as a real blobbing campaign as Qing, by the end of the game, you may aim to own a little something like this. Of course, you will continue to finish off this part of the mission tree if you haven't already. This is the only mission I need, and it is a super, super powerful one. If you took the Mandate of Heaven, of course, you will have the branch of the Mandate Holder right here. You will do those missions as well. And of course, when you form Qing, you will continue on to push to these missions right here, which are really, really nice. Like I said, they focus on conquest and on improving your nation economically and on devving and stuff like that. And by the end of your campaign, you will have finished these. And if you're the Mandate Holder, you will have finished the Mandate missions as well. Super, super powerful mission trees as John Zhu, as Manchu, and as Qing, and as the Emperor of China. Three different branches that you get based on what you do. Super, super nice missions. Make sure to complete all of them. This is what we took for our first two idea groups, Diplo and Admin. Like I said, a great opener for a blobbing campaign. After this, the choices are pretty much up to you. You, you won't make a mistake with any idea group. You can go with infrastructure and core ideas to help you manage your nation better. You can go with economic and trade to help you build up that income, or you could take a bunch of military ideas as well if you haven't already, like offensive or quality. You don't really need quantity as Shing or as a horde. So those are two I would recommend and then the rest are up to you. So in no particular order after Diplo and Admin, you can go for Economic and Infrastructure out of the Admin Idea Groups. You can go with Trade and Court out of the Diplo Idea Groups. And you can go with Offensive and Quality out of the Mill Idea Groups. I showed you what to take for your Horde Government Reforms and for your first five as Qing as well. And for your Tier 6 Government Reform, I recommend going with Royal Decree. For Tier 7, you should take Meritocratic Recruitment. For Tier 8, you should embrace the Economic Theory. For Tier 9, you can go with this one right here. And and for tier 10 and tier 11, all of them are really good. You won't make a mistake choosing either one of them. Take whatever you need at that point in the game. And like I said, by the time colonialism comes around, your game should look a little something like this. Let me know in the comments below what's the next nation that I should do a guide on. If you want to watch me do stuff like this live, you can follow me on twitch.tv slash redhawklive. And if you want to catch up on stuff from over there, you can subscribe to the second channel. Link is in the description. If you enjoyed this video, don't hesitate to leave a like. It really helps out a lot. And if you like the content and want to see more videos like this, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any of them. And you can become a member today and join the Discord. The link is in the description. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time with another EU4 video.